Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 591. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. Today is April 20th, 2020. All right, welcome to another program. This is our Monday program, and it's 591. Before we get too too started, too far into the program, please like us, subscribe to us, comment on us. If you want to listen to the podcast, that's in the show notes. Um, I think that's everything I want to talk about. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. A lot has happened in the news because we're still in COVID shock. Um, I'm walking to the grocery store this morning, and everybody's walking around in a daze. In Connecticut here, we've been upgraded to wear your damn mask uh, uh, edict from the governor. So I was walking around with their mask, and uh, it's just so creepy. I mean, they all look like zombies, and nobody's excited. Nobody's, you can't tell if they're smiling or if they're sad. And it's just it's a whole new level of surreal than it was last week. And I can see this in the church. I can see this in worship when I go to uh, videotape our stuff, and I'm sure you notice this too, that it just, it's so out of bounds for what we're used to as humans. I, I'm looking out the back window of our house onto mm-hmm. the 18th tee, the golf course, and they're foursome with men with Bermuda shorts and all with masks on on the golf course. Oh my. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, okay? <sighs> All right, so a quick recommendation here uh, before we get too far. I'm putting in the show notes a link to Gavin's new show. He's uh, uh, at least just recorded one episode. I want you guys to, if you uh, are lovers of Gavin like we are, click on it and watch it. Uh, It's in the show notes on the YouTube channel. Just follow this link. You'll be good for that. George, I want to talk quickly about something I call a la carte church. That's where the churches have kind of um, put themselves onto the internet and they've left many choices to the congregation people, the parishioners, the people seeking God as to where they want to attend. I'm no longer stuck going to the local Episcopal church at the corner of Elm and, and Main Street. I can now go to any Episcopal church or any Anglican church, Southern Baptist church, Methodist, Lutheran. I can always go to the Vatican. Uh, and it can become a la carte. I no longer am required to participate in worship locally. Have you seen this as well? Yes, indeed. And and it's uh, we're starting to talk, at least my vestry and I, my wardens and I, what does a church look like once we reopen? And some people, some uh, some clergy colleagues have said, well, we'll just pick up where we left off. There's no be any change. Once, we st- once this is over, we can stop doing... Uh, broadcast sermons, we can get back to the way we've always done church. And the consensus among our leaders, and my gut sense, is that no, we've we've reached a tipping point of sorts. So that in looking at the viewership of uh, our broadcast sermons, we broadcast midweek service and a Sunday service, and I've, to be frank, I've put more time into the production and post-production than in the sermon prep. And what I'm finding is that people are watching parts of the service and then clicking off. So people like me, my preaching, they'll watch that, but we don't have any, we don't have very good uh, music or visuals. And so they'll flip over to another service where they can be, get that portion of it. And then if they want to sort of have a sense of familiarity and community, they come back and hear the announcements. And in, in other words, the, 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 the elements that make up an Anglican service, for instance, or any worship service can be divided out and different. And what we're seeing, it, this is only a month's worth of work. It's beginning. I mean, not a lot of data on this yet, but. But what my gut and my just the feedback I'm getting is that people are picking and choosing slices of services. And how are we going are they going to be satisfied with what we've had in the past given this opportunity well it's april 20th right now 2020 that's a lot to say april 20th 2021 what's it going to be like what is church going to be like a year from now when people have for at least six months of their lives 
uh, seen other things in practice? Are they going to say, you know, <clears throat> Father George, I was watching this thing over on so and so's church in Kentucky, and I like that music. Can you incorporate this music into our church service in Florida? I think. And, and George, Joel Osteen has better teeth and better hair, and he's thinner. <laughs> Can you do something about your physical appearance? Uh. <laughs> Jeez, oh, yeah, that's even harder. And so I think you know these are some of the elements that we're going to have to deal with as a church when things get back to the new normal. And I, what I, you got to say, what's it going to look like? Well, I'm in, but at the same time, this, this is frightening on one level. It's frightening. Mm -hmm. for, in the past, I've said this before. I'll say it again. I always took Kevin for granted when we made this show because, you know, I just spoke and it magically appeared later in the day. I had no clue what went into production and post-production and all the minutiae of making a show until I had to do it myself for my little parish. And the, uh, but the, the people who are going to be able to prosper and triumph in this new era are those who already know how to do it. We've mentioned in the past, one of our viewers, uh, Daryl, I think is his first name from West Virginia, has a little little church uh, that has a huge internet presence compared to the tr traditional mainline churches because he is on the right side of the technology curve. He's got good doctrine, he's got, got good preaching. He doesn't have a stained glass beautiful building, but he's been able to leverage what he does have into a successful ministry, and I'm seeing that happen. So maybe the newer denominations or the younger clergy or whatever are going to leave old farts like me in the dust um, in this era. Well, there's that, and there's also the fact that the church in this aspect is growing. Every church, if they're online and they have Facebook or YouTube presence, are getting more and more and more viewers. People are you know finally saying well what is this all about you know and they're returning to kind of the the nun and duns or you know i'll, I'll, I'll reinvestigate church again because it's no I sweat off my brow i don't have to get up on sunday morning i don't have to dress i don't have to shower i don't have to put makeup on i can check church out again online and they're rediscovering the teachings they're rediscovering the stuff they were brought up on or the stuff that people have been telling about or they're rediscovering their love for the kingdom once again mm -hmm. and you're seeing this opportunity to give it to the church we uh, i bought a, an nt right tape a few years ago for a, a, a christian education forum and tom wright uh, former bishop of durham former professor uh, is now a professor again and he is doing quite well doing online classes and videos and i've been getting weekly or even twice a week uh things where uh, for 995 you can get his eight-week series on on revelation or this or that and the other and in the past that was always a nice little extra if you had the money you could buy it and show it to your sunday group or christian education group that is go that is stepping in and replacing in many aspects the live the teacher the local professional sharing his knowledge who's cribbing things from N.T. Wright's books, you just cut out the middleman. Sure. And how does that work out in itself in the future? If I had the answer, I'd be a wealthy man, and and uh, I don't know it. But with the resources are out there for the Christian truth to be shared in a, in a uh, powerful way. And it's just up to the people like me, the, the ministers, to not fight what's happening but uh, find a way to get with it and meet the people where they are. Kevin, you said something to me that, the, that there's nothing in the New Testament about that you have to show up, physically show up, otherwise the church is not the church. Is that, am I quoting well, you correctly? Uh, you and I in our pre-show had the discussion, you know, I got great viewership, how do I reach the kids? And I said, well, the, the kids are not on Facebook anymore, they're not on YouTube, they're on Snapchat and Instagram and TikTok and other places. And I was making the point that uh, there's nothing in the New Testament, in my understanding, that we set up camp and we wait for people to come to us. Uh, it's my understanding that we go and we go to the Facebook, the YouTube, the Instagram, the Snapchats, 
and we put our worship there we put our presence there and we work out how we're going to do the sacraments we need to uh, to think this out but that's where they are they're not in your churches and you're called to reach to them so what are you going to do and i think that's something we as an anglican communion need to discuss and think about over the uh, next year or so are we going to see a divide between the two portions of this in a net now this is anglican anglican inside baseball our services have two portions service of the mm -hmm. word and the eucharist mm -hmm. Are we going to see a functional split where, in essence, you show up once a month for a physical in-person Eucharist, but then get your service of the word online a weekly or even daily if you so desire? I mean, is that the future? I don't know. <laughs> what, or does the uh, uh, priest have to give you a quiz that you were actually watching his service before you came up for drive-by communion? And yeah, I don't know. This is... We as a church are just caught in this whirlwind of the greatest church planting movement in the history of the church happened in the last six weeks. Mm -hmm. We've gone from a few hundred thousand churches around the world to a billion, well, maybe not a billion, millions of new churches called house churches where people have set up in their living rooms, their dining rooms, their kitchens, their basements, their bedrooms, a place where they open up their laptops or their iPhones or whatever device they have and they worship. That's something that we could not have envisioned of five years ago and it's happening everywhere now. What do we do? Kevin, mm -hmm. I do want to say Paul envisioned this scenario 2,000 years ago. Okay. In his letter to the Corinthians when he said women should be silent in church. <laughs> That means she get us both in trouble. <laughs> women on the couch watching this broadcast should not be commenting. Uh, both of us have a live studio audience today. Uh, Mrs. Anglican TV had to go into the bathroom to take her conference call while we're recording. We'll thank her later. And you have a studio audience who's just can't wait to, to, to comment from the side. That's just life in, in co-host land. All right, so let's move on to talk about another topic. The Pope and I both think whiskey is holy water. <laughs> oh, George. Um, our favorite Anglican, Pope Francis, has spoken again, and uh, he has uh, described whiskey in a, a unique way. Tell us about that. Well, being a, a good low churchman, I don't necessarily agree with the Pope on about anything. And uh, this is one of those issues where I disagree profoundly. Uh, the, the Pope is a joy to Italian journalists. He had some comments about the virtues of whiskey and alcohol. And and I, I'm not really going to be able to say more than that. No, that's all right. No, no. Um, well, he's had lots of comments now about spiritual communion. Mm-hmm. Uh, specifically, uh, he likes the people watching the live stream to the Vatican. He likes that people are watching the local live streams where it's uh, available and taking part in church online. But he's saying virtual and spiritual communion, it's not real. It's not the real thing. Yeah, uh, Francis is really my favorite. It's, he's our favorite Anglican. Uh, he does come up with solutions and issues that are very pragmatic and... Uh, <laughs> Well, just a little bit of background. Francis was one of the first uh, major clerics to ask for a shutdown, and the Diocese of Rome and the Italian Catholic churches mm -hmm. were closed in the face of the coronavirus, and then step two, uh, closed to worship. Then step two was the parishes in the Diocese of Rome were closed to all visitors. You couldn't go in and worship privately. Well, that was backed away after some major protest. And but still the churches remain closed to worship in Italy and across most of the world, to be honest, uh, Protestant and Catholic. Most churches, are, almost all churches are closed everywhere. France and Francis, meanwhile, has been broadcasting his daily masses in the morning. And the masses that he broadcasts from the Vatican uh, with he and some clergy acolytes got about one to two million views on Italian uh, social media and TV. And so when I feel sa satisfied that I've gotten a few uh, hits when people watch my show, I've got to, I don't have the reach the Pope does. Well, 
the success of Francis's televised masses has caused some pushback from Italian Catholic thinkers and bishops. And the pushback is coming both from the hard left and the hard right within the Catholic. Well, I'll take out the word hard. It's coming from both left traditionalists right. yeah. and progressives. Uh, so like from the San Didigio community and some of the newer uh, Catholic communities and organizations, they're saying, this is basically robbing Peter to pay Paul, meaning we're, it's good that they're watching, but that they're not going to come back if they physically, in other words, they've learned that they don't physically have to be present to take part in the Mass because the Pope is sacrificing the Mass for them, and through spiritual communion, they are taking part spiritually. And we're hearing the same criticism from the conservative side. And the Pope responded to this on Friday in his address, uh, basically saying that, uh, well, I'll read a little bit. Uh, we are together, but not together, telling the TV audience. Even the sacrament today, today you have it, but the, the, Eucharist, the Eucharist, but the people who are connected with us only with spiritual communion. And this is not the church. The church is in a difficult situation, which the Lord allows, but the ideal of the church is always with the people and with the sacraments, always. So what Francis is saying is that this is a temporary aberration and that spiritual communion is no substitute for physical communion that's and we're just having to live with this because of the times that we're in and this goes back to our our event our discussion uh is church real unless it's in person or have we reached some sort of tipping point where we now have to find new ways to relate to people in a different world and the world is different, George. Uh, COVID-19 and this pandemic have been inconvenient and a struggle for us in Western America and Europe and stuff like that. We whine, we moan, but in the large part, we're gonna make it through this. Mm -hmm. But COVID-19 does not mean truce. It doesn't mean wars are over and um, there's peace amongst this world because I, read an article and I'm going to go over here to Anglican Inc right here on our show I can do that if I can find my cursor sorry I was so prepared for this before on Anglican Inc you posted a story from Ben Kwashi which uh, talked about uh, the struggles in Nigeria they're being attacked in a lockdown the uh, Islamic influence over there does not recognize truce yeah, Nigeria is under lockdown. The president uh, ordered first Lagos and Abuja to be closed down for two weeks, and now it's going to be another two weeks to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. Uh, one of our uh, friends to this show, Les Martin, who is a, a former Pittsburgh priest who's a missionary in Nigeria, had a comment on Facebook today that there's a bit of a change. Today is the first day that more people were killed by the coronavirus than killed by the police <laughs> in Lagos. Mm. So it is getting worse, which is a terrible, terrible comment, but I thought it was amusing. Yeah, well, yeah I mean, it's sad, but, the, but, but it's the, amusing. But the, uh, most of the country is in lockdown. And unfortunately, the army seems to have gone into lockdown too because the Fulani Muslim militants I have been on a spree of attacking and burning and killing Christians. The Ben Kwashi had a, uh, uh, a, a, a comments put out by Release International and a Christian aid organization, which we reprinted, that talked about you know Muslim you know herdsmen coming to villages and setting fire to houses, and as the children and women run out of the houses because the men had already come out to fight them, and the women and children are sheltering. As they come out of the house, as they're being mown down by guns, that they're basically targeting women and children right now. This is a war of extermination against Christians, hmm. uh, specifically Christians, because Muslim villages aren't being targeted. Um, and the Nigerian government, which is inefficient and ineffective at times, uh, is just doing nothing. Uh, nothing to, they are, I'm sure they're doing some stuff, but they're not doing enough and the evil is just continuing. It is. Let's, let's talk a little bit about trickle-down economics. 
I know, Reagan, Bush, long time ago, doesn't exist, never worked. Well, what we're seeing right now with COVID is the prime example. People are not giving anymore to the missions in Rwanda, Nigeria, Uganda, uh, around the world. You have a story you're working on where 99% of the giving to uh, a certain diocese in Rwanda is just evaporated because people here in America have lost jobs. Yeah, uh, in the, you know, my parish, we had our vestry meeting this morning and uh, we reported, you know, people are still giving in the shutdown. Checks are being mailed in and far, far below our normal uh, income. So, what, And then, of course, we have these government programs that we can, st if we can take advantage of them. Uh, the SBA sort of muffled, fumbled the ball on this one. But nonetheless, there are steps in place to sort of keep the doors and the operations going. The Bishop of Kigali has written that contributions are down 99% in his diocese because Rwanda's government has instituted a hard lockdown. The borders are closed. Public transport has been shut down. Uh, only people in certain specified industries, nurses, doctors, government workers, are able to leave their homes. And most people in Rwanda live, you know, have small scale, either work in small scale mom and pop businesses or they're street traders or they work in the land and they can't leave their villages. And so we're starting to see hunger and famine because all trade has stopped. And the Bishop of Kigali has written that the clergy aren't being paid in Rwanda. The We can't pay, keep the lights on. We can't, you know, keep the water running. Uh, because our, our, and it's not because we've done something, but because the people who support our work they have their their income has stopped as well so the church is in danger institutionally it's in it's insolvent right now and this is kigali and we're seeing this all across africa um where the church is facing insolvency because the not only are foreign donations ending but the local economy is tanking tanking dramatically and the first thing that is stopping when income stops, people aren't able to give to churches anymore. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to watch. Um, nobody in my family has lost their jobs, but we have lots of friends who are down to part-time uh, or have lost their income or they're about to lose their health insurance. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to watch. Quick update on Bishop Love. Bishop Love, physically, he's fine. We're not, fine, yeah. <laughs> not a health issue. As an aside, Bishop Woods, Steve Woods, is home from the hospital. Mm -hmm. There was a very complimentary article in the Charleston newspaper about him, and it's behind a paywall, so I didn't read it all. I didn't particularly want to subscribe, but I'm friends tell me that it's a lovely article, and if you are in South Carolina and can't access this, do it, share it, uh, because it really does paint your local bishop in a very good light. But... Bill Love's trial was to be today. His trial for being a Christian. Uh, well, that's not fair. No one is fair. I can say, you know, for following the formularies of a 2,000-year-old church, he was about to be trialed. Yes, he was trialed? Or trialed. <laughs> tried. I can make up my own words. <laughs> I am the producer of this thing. I'll make up my words if I want to. Trialed. Well, the, the court of inquiry for a bishop... Uh, first wanted to know whether we could have a television trial and it's not provided for the rules it has to be in person and because of the lockdowns and travel bans and new york is one of the stricter states governor cuomo like connecticut has put in a uh, a mask ban a mask requirement ban, yeah it's not out. a ban it's it's a requirement keep going and so the now now kevin and i were wondering why do they even bother having a trial because the sentence has already been been found but mm -hmm. are you going to hold up a liquor store or something or what is <laughs> well, i'm gonna go visit my bank <laughs> okay well, yeah. bill love's trial has been postponed indefinitely so his being left dangling in the wind is going to continue for the foreseeable future and it's a shame really uh I, what is i mean the, we know it when it's all done, said and done in months or years, when we finally take him to trial, we know what the verdict's going to be. Um, I don't think they can save face and walk away from it. 
they're just they're too into it and they have to say listen he's like the last conservative bishop in the episcopal church you you, you gotta play ball or you're gonna walk and yes but at the same time nick nicely he's the presiding judge he's the bishop of rhode island he is liberal but he's a decent fellow and fair play and honesty are not the preserve of any one side i mean you can still have different views and come to this from different positions but i i do think that if i were to have a judge hearing my case i would prefer someone like bishop nicely because he he's of that newer generation who are not the ideologues they're not the jack spongs of the past where the cause was all important mm -hmm. um so who knows i don't want to be too dismissive of the we, there we are can't, some kooks and nuts in the process yes well, there are but and we can't be dismissive because we believe in uh, a powerful god and we believe in prayer we believe in miracles and we believe that people can uh, be repentant and we also need to distinguish mm -hmm. because the they're going to try yes i don't think they can drop this but they need to finesse it now who is they the presiding bishop and the sort of controlling group in the House of Bishops. They need to finesse this because they, the public relations consequences of a guilty verdict and then being kicked out of the Episcopal Church will be very poor. And at a point where the presiding bishops, uh, all you need is love campaign. Uh, the all you need is love except this one love. <laughs> except this one. Uh, love conquers all. Uh, it just is not going to work. So. If I were to play, if I were to play hardball analysis of knowing the players, I think they'll find him guilty, but they'll then give him a slap on the wrist, saying, "Don't do it again." Uh, okay, but George, okay, that's. The, I agree. I want to transition to a really hard story for us. If you look, our last episode was not liked very well. On the far right column, it only says. 82% of people liked our last show. Oh. Compared to our normal 99%, 99%, 99%, 99%. Comments are way up too. I want to reach out and thank all the people who took time to comment on our last show uh, and uh, give us some uh, people that they would recommend to have the third seat. We appreciate that very much. George and I are in talks about it and have a few ideas that we will uh, position before you guys over the next month or two. Um, we love transition as much as you love transition. I don't like transition at all when I'm lying. <laughs> oh, we had we had such uh, Kevin. You had such grief when you uh, uh, moved from Bill Witt to me, <laughs> and you had we had such grief when we added. Uh, uh, Peter uh, old yeah. and then when we lost Peter old mm -hmm. and then it was then it was a two to duo for a few more years and then we added Gavin and now we've lost Gavin people dislike change they Did like you, I, they, they like the show that they imagine the show to be rather than what it is the most complaints I got and they they fell short right away like the first three or four weeks we had Gavin what is this? You guys, what, two was fine. We don't need no three. And then, you know, people adjusted to the transition. Okay. Well, oh, Gavin's so cool. And yeah, darn too. He's cool. That's why he's on the program. You know, people love, yeah, don't like transition, but they do grow. They are able to adapt. And one of the things I think in, in recommending people to, to join us in their show, I think this is a commitment of, uh, what, six hours a week? Four hours a week? Four to six minimum, yeah. Four to six. Now, uh, I can sometimes, I, it's tough for me uh, because I have a full-time job, but uh, I enjoy doing it, and uh, I let my uh, other jobs uh, suffer. Suffer. <laughs> suffer. So it, it's not uh, something that uh, you just hop in for a half hour every Friday. Um, because there's there's three to four times the work behind uh, what's the way of describing it for every well, you you have to invest so much time for every minute that you get out of the product and it's true because we don't just sit here and talk we have to know the news 
We have to be uh, uh, up read on everything that's happening. I have to certainly read every Anglican Inc. story that George has posted because he's going to want to talk about that. We have to know generally what's going on around the world outside the church. And so there's a lot of, George and I are news junkies. Uh, if, I, if I'm not playing Tetris on the computer, I'm reading news. If George is not reading theology books and, and history books, writing letters reading. to little old ladies. <laughs> you know, and so our replace, uh, the third seat has to be another news junkie, another person who loves politics, loves news, and loves to talk about it in the church, in the context of the church. So we appreciate all the uh, recommendations. If you have any more, put them in the comments. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 591 of Anglican Unscripted.